attitude making concessions to Rome, let us arouse to comprehend the situation and view the contest before us in its true bearings. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message which is present truth for this time. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awaking the world to a sense of the value of the privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed. So while the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to Rome, what we did is we went to um, uh, a couple of verses in the Bible to establish what we can know about uh, Protestantism as it is in the world today. We recognise from, uh, we may look at this more closely later in the week, but I, I think I'm just going to take it for granted that we all understand that Protestantism is the second beast of Revelation uh, chapter 13. That um, it represents the work of the United States and in particular the religion of the United States. And when we look at the uh, dynamics that occurred back in history under a threefold union, we can look and we can learn about the role of Protestantism at the end of the world. God's people faced a threefold enemy. They faced a dragon and a beast and a false prophet, a kingly power, a church power, and a spirit power. When we look at Elijah, uh, in Elijah's time, his enemy was Ahab, Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal. First literal, then spiritual. Where do we go to find out who was the spiritual Jezebel at the end of the world? Revelation, Revelation chapter, chapter 2. It's Jezebel that teaches and seduces God's people. She's the church of the 1260 years. She is the papacy. When we go back to this controversy, the controversy with Elijah, where, where, where was the, the crisis point in the time of Elijah? Where were they? Where, where, where were, when, when Elijah actually had to face his, when his D-Day was, whereabouts was it? The main story of Elijah. Where, where, when we look back at the story of Elijah, where were they in this, at that um, major crisis point? Worship. But where were they? Oh, location. The location is a mountain, it's the church itself. They were at Mount Carmel, weren't they? They were Mount Carmel. Who was there? Elijah? Yeah. Yeah. Ahab? <coughs> Was she there? No. Where was she? She was home. She was home. She was in Samaria. Yes. She was not there. Did she have to be there? No. You couldn't see her. She had her ally. She had the pro they, they represented her. They were her image. She was way back home, but she was pulling the strings. So who were you to watch? The prophets of Baal. The same when you come down to the, the major crisis story of John the Baptist is where? In the, the king, the, the king's party. It's birthday party, isn't it? Yes. It's party time. Herod's there. Where's Herodias? She's not there. She, does she have to be there? No. No, because her image is there. This do the, do the daughter was the image of her mother. And there she is there doing this deceptive dance to get the king on board to do the work of Jezebel. So the dynamics are the same. We don't watch Jezebel Herodias. We know she's working. She's down there behind the scenes pulling the strings. We're to watch the prophets of Baal, the work of Salome. And, and today, that those two, th 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 these, are, these were the deceptive powers literally but today, spiritually, they take the name of Christian. Because we're told, Jesus said, be not deceived, they will come in my name. Yes. And they will do this the deceiving power. So she says, while the Protestant world, while the so-called Christian world is by her attitude or her image making concessions to who? Rome, her mum, while she's saying, yes, mum, I'll do whatever you ask, mum. Let us arouse to comprehend the situation and view the contest before us in its true bearings. What's the contest? 
They want us dead. <laughs> it's life or death. What was the contest for Elijah? Yeah. And, and actually, when you think about it, what, what was the contest about on, Tru- on the, Mount Carmel? What were they arguing about? Who was the true prophet? Who's the true prophet? Was it the prophets of Baal or was it Elijah? It was the one who could call fire down from heaven. Could the prophets of Baal do it? No, No, but Elijah could. Turn that around, come down to the end of the world. And who's the true prophet? The one that can call fire down from heaven? No. (laughs) Revelation chapter 13 tells us that the, the false prophet will call fire down from heaven. So however it looks at the end of the world, it's going to be same but different. And we have to be able to recognise those that, that dif- difference. Understanding where we're at at the party or what's happening on Mount Carmel lets us know where we are in prophetic history. It's, it wakes us to a sense of true Protestantism and, religious, and understanding of religious liberty. So there is a contest going on for us right now at the moment. And this is our message. The watchmen are now to lift up their voice and give the message that is present truth for this time. So we saw that this deceptive power is one of the three parts that make up modern Babylon. And to understand modern Babylon at the end of the world, where do we go? We go to literal Babylon. And so I want to take a little divergent now. We, we, we want to um, explore more about um, Protestantism. But we're going to start at the beginning. This will be a, a, li- a little bit easy for the end of the day. So Protestantism is a threefold union of modern Babylon. And I think I showed you my little map, didn't I? I did my little picture. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. So actually turn to Daniel chapter 2. Let's go. Let's, Let's try this. Okay, Daniel chapter 2. We're all familiar. This is an open book quiz. This is just revision of what you already know. Peter said to to, uh, the church that he was writing to, he says, I'm going to remind you of things of you already know to establish you in present truth. Uh, So that's what we'll do now. We'll we'll just go do a bit of revision to try and get a more of an understanding of, of, um, of Babylon at the end of the world. Daniel chapter two gives us how many kingdoms of Bible prophecy? Four. How do we know there's four? Give me a proof text for there being four kingdoms of Bible prophecy. How would you tell somebody that there was four? Yeah, verse. Daniel 2, verse. Well, verse 37 tells us that the head of gold is who? Nebuchadnezzar. Or... But how do we know this for? Verse 40. 40. The verse 40 says, And the fourth kingdom. So first kingdom is Babylon. Second kingdom is? Third. And the fourth is as strong as iron, and we understand it to be? Rome. And it will tell us that Rome comes in how many phases? Two phases, pagan and papal. So we've got gold, silver, brass, 
and iron. An iron mixed with clay. And the head of gold, according to verse 37, is who? Thou, O king. So that head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar. But what does the very next uh, verse 39 say? Very next verse. After thee shall arise another kingdom. kingdom. So this head is both a king and a kingdom. Can you have a king without a kingdom? Can you have a kingdom without a king? You have to have both. And that's very, very important when you come down to the stone kingdom. Because what is the stone kingdom? It's a king and a kingdom. It's combined. Christ never separates himself from his people. He always identifies himself with his people. And the, these kingdoms are always identified with kings. So when we think of Medo-Persia, who are you going to think of? Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, Greece, Alexander, and then you could go on to your other four. Rome? First Pat yeah, or, or, or we could just say Caesar. Caesar, but constant and 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 papacy. The Pope, a Pope, a Pope. Okay, so there's always. Can you have a papacy without a Pope? Can you have a Pope without a papacy? Right. So that that's a very important. It sounds like a duh, but it's a very important principle. Um, so. Um, that's Daniel chapter 2. And what do we notice? What's the principle that we get from Daniel 2 when we go from gold, silver, brass to iron and clay? Progressive, Progressive what? Degeneration. Progressive degeneration because we go, it loses worth, doesn't it? Gold is more expensive. But we also see an increase, don't we? Something else that's progressive. Yes. What... The last kingdom is this, the Bible says very strong. So it increase, decreases in value, yes. but increases in power. strength or power. Yes. Hardness. Mm -hmm. Decreases in value, increases in the hardness of their hearts, you might say. <laughs> so the book of Daniel is built on the principle of repeat and enlarge. God is going to say the same thing and repeat it, but just give us different symbols so that we can line them, juxtapose, juxtaposition them and get more information. So our next line of prophecy is going to come from which book? Which, sorry, which chapter? Daniel chapter? Seven. Daniel 7. And what now does the head of gold become? A meter Persia? <laughs> And Greece and Rome. I'll just call him a beast. Nondescript beast. Can't describe it. It's a bit of everything. So we have um, four types of animals. How would you describe those animals? Yeah, they're uh, fearless. They're Wild, untamable lions. Oh, sorry. Yes. If you were to go to a circus, would you see a lion? So you can tame a lion, but you would never quite trust them. But they, they, they are tameable. Can you see a bear? Yes. Not to the same extent. A bear is more unpredictable than a lion. What about a leopard? Ever thought there was a leopard in a circus? Right, they're, they're very, very unpredictable. Yes. And, and this thing, don't even try. <laughs> so they're just, they're increasing in ferocity. So each of these chapters is built upon a different theme. The theme of Daniel chapter 2 is a king and a kingdom. Why has God given us these kingdoms now as ferocious wild animals? What is he trying to tell us? If you go to Daniel chapter 7... Daniel 7 says, verse 1, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. 
Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea and four great beasts came out from the sea different from one another. So what does he see upon the sea? The sea represents what? What does the sea symbolize? A lot of people. And there's wind. What does wind represent? Strife, warfare, commotion. And out of all this strife arises four beasts. And they are, they are wild. And what do they do to each other? They fight each other. What Daniel 7 is teaching us is about how these kingdoms conquer and rule. If we sum up that, we could call it politics. How they conquer and how they rule. And how do they conquer and rule? Like wild animals. <laughs> they see something, they're just going to growl and snarl and bite and they're going to do whatever they want to get what they want. So that's, this is how those kingdoms behave. Okay, so then we come down, this, if we can just stop and start comparing this last kingdom, Rome. When we looked at Rome in Daniel 2, we said that it came in two phases, pagan and papal. And how were they represented in Daniel 2? The legs were yeah. pagan Rome. Just, so what does that pure iron represent? Pagan Rome, the pa Rome of the Caesars, Imperial Rome, pure, a pure government, state power. But then we get down to the feet and the iron is mixed with? Clay. clay. What is represented by the clay? Weakness. It's weak? Yes. Yes. And steel. Who was weak in our stories before when we looked at Elijah? Who was the weak, uh, weaker vessel? John? We had a kingly power, a church power, and a spirit, uh, spirit power, a deceiving power. Which was the weaker vessel? Jezebel. She's just a weak woman. What can she do? She needs a king. God represents, you'll see prophecies in, in Isaiah, we won't look them up for time, where God refers to his church as a clay vessel. Clay represents church power, the weaker vessel. So what's stronger, a, a vessel made of metal or a vessel made of clay? So here we've got a combination of church and state. Um, let me give you a quote on that actually. Uh, this is from 4 BC 1168. I'll write it up here. 4 BC 1168. Four Bible Commentary. Bible Commentary Volume 4, 4 BC. Uh, we're told the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and, a cl and clay. This union is weakening all the powers of the churches. This investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. Uh, men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recoil upon themselves. So she was told by... Uh, um, uh, Inspiration tells it that it represents the mingling of church craft and state craft. Um, let's have it. Let, go to Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. And we'll start in verse twenty. We all there? Two Peter two twenty. 
Second Peter. Second Peter, two twenty. Peter is talking to the church. He says, he says, For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So he's talking about people that come out of the world, out of the pollution of the world, come into Christ and then go back, backslide. Their, their end is worse than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. What do we call mire today? Do we say mire? It's mud. And what is mud? It's just dirt. It's the pollutions of the world, according to this passage. So mire is mud, which are the pollutions of the world. And what kind of clay have we got down that is mingling with the iron? It's miry clay. It's a polluted worldly church. So any church that is worldly, that has to have state power to give it strength, is a, a miry church. And, got, and, and, and it's, it's like a, a, um, uh, um, so I, when, when a church, when a church doesn't have the power of God, then what does it have to have? It has to have the power of state because it's got to get power from somewhere. Jezebel had to get somewhere, power from somewhere. So did Herodias. So go to um, Psalm chapter 40 verse 1. Psalm 40, verse 1. Psalm 40, 30, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. So where was David? He was in a pit. He was in with the miry clay. He was in a worldly church. Is the rock in the worldly church? You've got to come out of the miry clay to set your feet upon a rock. The rock is not in the miry clay. So that's a principle we've got to remember. So the miry clay, this is a polluted worldly church that joins itself with the state for power purposes. Remember, he came out of a pit. He came out of a ditch. And who falls off a path into a ditch? Yeah, the blind. Okay, so, and so when we come over to Daniel 7... We get more information of how this church and state relationship work. We go to the beast of Daniel chapter 7. And what are we told in Daniel 7? Let Open book quiz. So we've got iron and miry clay in Daniel 2. But what's, how is that repeated and enlarged upon in Daniel 7? If we go to, um, I, I, I guess if we went to uh, verse 7, we're told about the fourth beast. We'll read it. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. I want you to compare this. Keep your finger here in Daniel 7. And go back to Daniel 2. What are we told the Iron Kingdom does in Daniel 2 verse 40? It, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron 
breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. So what does the iron kingdom do? Breaks, breaks, breaks. Now go back to Daniel 7, and what does that fourth beast do? In verse 7, it breaks, devours, stamps. Rome, we say Rome comes in three phase, uh, sorry, two phases, and it does, pagan and papal, but what happens to papal Rome? It died, receives a deadly wound, dies, and then it resurrects. So while we have two phases of Rome, pagan and papal, we actually have three times that Rome breaks, breaks, breaks. Pagan, papal, before the deadly wound, and then the resurrected papal church. So I won't write that up. We'll go back to that in, in, uh, later. But here in verse 7, it breaks, devours, stamps. So in chapter 2, we see that we've got a combination of iron and miry clay, but how it's a, it's a combination of church and state. How is that represented here in Daniel chapter 7? Have a look at verse 25. What does this beast do? He speaks great words against the Most High and he wears out the saints of the Most High and thinks to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. What does the church need the state power to do? Change times and laws and? Persecution. Wear out the saints of the Most High. If you're going to break, 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 a church is going to need state power. If you're going to break, devour, stamp, you need state power. And so here, this church, this miry um, clay church, needs state power to wear out the saints of the Most High and to change times and laws, to enforce its own beliefs. Verse 25, Daniel 7, verse 25. How does the little horn change times and laws? Yeah. Through the combination of church and state. Yes. Okay, any questions on Daniel 2 and Daniel 7? I have a question. When we look at the image in Daniel chapter 2, we see gold, silver, glass, and iron. That's the fourth beast. But there is on the feet, on the feet there is clay and iron. So the way I understand the, the the iron is still which is again seen on the on the legs is seen down there. The clay is a new element which has come in. There was iron but there's a new element which is clay. And so that clay to me when I read Daniel seven when I go to I, I go I go to first eight. Verse 8, can you read verse 8 please from there? I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before the whom there were three first up. So, so your clay is the little horn. So the, the, the beast, the, the, fourth, the fourth beast, the little horn comes out of the fourth beast. So the fourth beast is the same as, I mean the little horn is the same as clay because both of them, they, they speak pompous words. They blaspheme the name of God. So it is the, the purpose which has come in in clay. Because it's wrong, but there is clay. So when you look clay, uh, the, the, the little horn, and the beast from the sea, all these things are the same thing. Mm. That's the way I understand according to this verse and the rest of the verses in, in, in the Bible. So it's the same thing. So we can we could com compare we can compare and go back and forth in great detail between these chapters. But what I just want you to get the gist of what we're doing because we've got a purpose. I want I'm I'm, I'm heading towards you know we we want to focus in on Protestantism at the end of the world. So I understand what you're saying, but there are many similarities that we can draw. So. Rome, and we will come back to the threefold, the three phases of Rome, uh, pagan, papal, and modern, when we get to Daniel chapter 11. Um, okay, Daniel 8. 
What kind of, uh, how, how are these kingdoms represented in Daniel chapter 8? Do we see Babylon? I'm going to say we do, but we won't look, we'll, we'll look at that a bit later. Not, 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 not openly. How do we see Medo Persia? No. Medo Persia is? The ram. Greece is? The he goat. And Rome is? Not in Daniel 8. Daniel 8. Verse 9. A little horn. What kind of animals have we got here? What's the difference between these animals and these animals? Where do you see these animals used? In the sanctuary. They're sacrificial animals. You can take your ram and your he goat. What, if you went to the sanctuary with your sacrificial animal, what did you do with it? Turn to Psalm 118, verse 27. Psalm 118, 27. God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the what? The horns of the altar. Do you have to have a horn that's attached to an animal in the sanctuary? Where do we see horns in the sanctuary that aren't attached to animals? On the altars. The altars had horns. And what was the purpose of those horns? You would take your sacrifice in and you tied your sacrifice to the horns of the altar. You killed the sacrifice and you, the blood was taken from that sacrificial animal and placed on the, the horn. The life of the animal was transferred to the sanctuary via the horns of the altar. Psalm 118. So what this is telling us is what kind of animal, sacrificial animal did you take to the sanctuary? What, you could not have any imperfection. Was this a um, legitimate sacrificial, why? It had one horn higher than the other. It was a not quite right ram. So you, it was, it was a, not a viable sacrifice. What about the he goat? Sorry? It had a, it had, have you ever seen a goat with a horn between its eyes? And then it broke. So this is a, uh, you had to take, um, your, had, your sacrificial animal had to be without blemish. blemish. And these animals had blemish. But you would take your animal in, you would tie it to the horn, the life of the animal was placed, uh, transferred to the sanctuary via the horn. So what Daniel 7 is telling us is all about politics how these nations conquered and ruled. Daniel 8 is telling us all about their religion. What Daniel 7 is about politics, Daniel 8 is about religion. And what kind of religion do these kingdoms have? False religion. But they're counterfeited on God's system. So we saw with the study we did earlier just how Satan counterfeits everything. Pagan religion is just a counterfeit of God's true religion. And this is what Daniel 8 is telling us, the story of Daniel 8, is that it is all based on counterfeit religion. So why do the kingdoms behave like they do in Daniel 7? Why do they behave like wild animals? 
because this is what they believe. And what do they believe? Go, go to Daniel 8. If we look at Daniel 8 and in verse 3, Daniel sees a ram which has two horns. Verse 4, the ram pushes westward, northward, southward. And at the end of verse 4, it says, he did according to his will and became? He became great. What about the he goat? So the he goat comes up, clashes with the, the, the ram, um, uh, breaks the two horns. And in verse 8, it says the he, the he goat waxes. Very great. Then those animals are tied to the horn, or, or we see the little horn of verse 9. Because, uh, are, are we all clear that this little horn of verse 9 is not attached to an animal? Yeah. Okay, if you look at verse 8, let's, let's look at this. The he goat waxes very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So we've got a he goat with one horn, it breaks, out comes four, and what direction are those four, four horns going? Heaven. North, south, east, west. Okay, those four horns, four notable ones, are towards the four what? Winds of heaven. And then it says, out of one of them. Out of one of what? The winds. Out of one of the winds. This horn isn't coming out of one of the other four horns. It's coming out of one of the winds. What kind of a word is them, by the way? It's a pronoun, isn't it? What's a pronoun? It takes the place of a noun. So we've got to ask ourselves, which noun is it taking the place of? Is it taking the place of notable ones or is it taking the place of winds? How do we determine that? What are the English rules to determine which noun is that them referring to? The one that's closest. So in English, we would go the, the noun that is nearest to the pronoun. And what's the noun that's nearest to the pronoun? Winds. That horn comes out of a wind. It doesn't come out. Have you ever seen a horn growing out of a horn? That horn does not come out of another horn. It comes out of the wind. Because what is wind? Strife. Warfare. So if you picture the world, right, here's the Mediterranean Sea. And here's the deserts of Arabia. And here's Egypt. And here's Asia Minor. And over here's Europe. So you've got Greece. You've got, I can't draw, but there's Rome, right? All the way over here in the west, okay? The, the Alexander's kingdom owns all of this. It's divided into the north, south, east, and west. But who else is, and in the west is Greece. But who else is also in the west? Rome, but Rome is just wester than Greece. So Rome is out of here, but what's happening over here in Europe? Warfare, wind, strife. So out of more war that is occurring over here, this little horn is going to come up. And what is going to happen to all these other religions, the religion of Medo-Persia, the religion of Greece? What does Rome do as it conquers? What does it do to their religions? Does it stamp them out? All the blood, all the life of that ram and that he-goat gets transferred to Rome. And that's the story of Daniel 8. So I'm, I'll just rub this out. I want, you, so I want you to see that Daniel 8 is very different to Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is about conquering politically, military power. Daniel 8 is about religion. The ram waxes 
great. The heat goat waxes very great. The little horn waxes exceeding great. And what does that word great mean? It's the word Gadal. And the word Gadal means the spirit of self exaltation. It's their religion, their pagan religion. So the ram, did the lamb, was the, did the lamb, ram, ram think it was great? Yes. Yeah, how great did the ram think it was? The Medes and Persians made laws that couldn't be changed, they made laws of infallibility. Why do you have laws of infallibility? You don't make a mistake. That's the frustrating thing about Daniel chapter 6, that Daniel in the lion's den, is the king said, I can't change the law. Why not? You're the king. Well, then I'd have to have said I made a mistake. I'm infallible. This, have you ever heard anything more ridiculous in your life? Change the law. You're the king. They, 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 they had laws of infallibility because they were great you come down to the goat and he thinks he's what so he starts lifting himself up even more alexander the great who did he think he was a demigod he was half god and half man they killed his dad because his dad thought he was god and they thought oh he's got to be crazy so they killed him right? they, people didn't usually tolerate that much <laughs> okay then we come down to the little horn and he waxes what He's going to take all these beliefs and incorporate them to his own religion. And he's going to wax exceeding great. And what does this little horn, who does the little horn represent? Rome. Does Rome make laws of infallibility? Does Rome think it's God? It goes even beyond what um, Alexander thought he was just half God. Now you get to Caesar and they're God on her earth. It's crazy talk. So this, this, is, this is a religion of paganism. It lifts itself up more and more and, um, until you get to papal Rome. And if you look at verse 11, verse 11 says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. That word magnified is the same word as great. It's that same spirit of exaltation. It's paganism. If we were to go back to Babylon... What's the story in Daniel about Babylon where he lifted himself up? Who was the king of Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar. Is there a story where he thought he... Yeah, when he built the great... Look at this great city which I have built for my own power. Right? He, he uh, became... He magnified himself. And... What, what was the story? What happened to him? He was sent to the forest to graze for seven years. Graze is a what? Like, a, like an animal, like a beast. Like an ox. Yeah. He's the original. It's the original religion. So he's there in Daniel, but he's not mentioned in Daniel 8, but he's there in the story. He's the original sacrificial animal. And what happened to him as an ox? What did that show about him? He's completely mad. He had to go and live on a whole food, plant-based diet for seven years to get his insanity back. You know, to, to magnify yourself is insanity. And this is the religion of paganism. It's crazy. But what does, how does it make you behave? Crazy. So this, this is how they behave. Daniel 8 tells us why they behave the way they do, why these kingdoms are at war, why they are lifting themselves up. So that's the story of Daniel 8. Any questions on that? I, didn't, um, I muddied that a little. Come on. So um, we could go in and look at the the horns but um, I mean and then when we, we looked at Daniel 2 we see that their, their morality decreases why does their morality decrease because paganism increases why does their hearts harden because of their religion 
So we know now why now know why it goes from gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay. It's because of their theology. Okay, Daniel chapter eleven. If you think, just on, on, on another note before we go to Daniel 11, if you think that that little horn came out of another horn, that, there's no, nothing, that would be saying that Rome came out of Greece. No. Rome didn't come out of Greece. So it, it, you, you have to go get against history, but it is actually what Protestantism teaches. And they teach that for a reason because they, they go back to Antiochus Epiphanes. They do away with the daily. Our, uh, they don't understand that the, the, the paganism is uh, the, the continual. It's, it's what's been around from the beginning. What has been around from the beginning is paganism, this lifting up of yourself. Uh, it began in Eden when Satan said to the woman, uh, you will not surely die. You will be as? That's crazy talk. <laughs> That's paganism. And that paganism got transferred to Cain, the, the controversy between Cain and Abel, because Cain thought he could come up with a religion of his own. He could worship the works of his own hands. That's pure paganism. So when it talks about the daily, it, talk, it means what's continual, what's been around from the beginning. And it's this <coughs> spirit of self-exaltation that started in heaven, in the courts of heaven with Lucifer, because he thought he could be like the Most High came down to heaven and he's been just sharing his religious beliefs with Eve and then Cain and then everyone until we've got whole kingdoms that have this theology. So, you know, went from individuals to families to Cain was an individual but then shared it with his families. They, went, they moved to the east so they could worship the sun um, and then all those false religions came from there and then developed into Babel, a city that developed into Babylon, a kingdom, etc. And he's not going to stand uh, it still until he's got the whole world. Okay, so the point of that was to show that, if, uh, that that little horn is not attached to another horn, to, to the, those other animals. So Daniel chapter 11. What's the story of Daniel chapter 11? King of the North and the King of the South. So, Daniel 11. Go to Daniel chapter 10. Because da when we talk about Daniel, when we talk about Daniel 8, we really mean Daniel 8 and 9 because they go together. And when we talk about Daniel 11, we mean 10 and 11, 12 because that, it's all one vision. So if we go to Daniel chapter 10 and we know that Gabriel has come to explain a prophecy to Daniel. And in verse 14, what is, he's going to tell Daniel what Daniel 11 is about. Verse 14, sorry, Daniel 10, 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. So what's Daniel 11 about? What, what is going to happen to Daniel's people and who are Daniel's people? Yeah. We are Daniel's people. So first literal, then spiritual. So the literal Jews were Daniel's people back in that time. And today we are Daniel's people. The seed of Abraham. And what shall befall thy people in the latter days? For the vision shall be for many days. <coughs> so what's going to befall God's people in the latter days? Now, Wendy, what's, what did you say Daniel 11 is about? The king of the north and the king of the south. But does the, which one of them befalls God's people? What does it mean to befall? They're going to fall on them, aren't they? At the most simplest level. Is it the king of the north or the king of the south that is going to befall God's people at the end of the world? The king of the north. And so let's go to Jeremiah chapter 25. No, sorry, Jeremiah chapter 1. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, and we'll jump into verse 13. Jeremiah 1, 13. 13? 
And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come. And they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem and against all the walls thereof round about and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. So who burns incense to other gods and worships the works of their own hands? Yeah, pagans, don't they? Mm -hmm. Pagans do that. And, but what's been happening with God's people? They've been mingling the paganism with their own religion. So they've been worshipping like a pagan. So what is God going to do according to these verses? He's going to send all the families of the King of the north, of the north. Who are all the families of the north? The Babylonian family, the Medo-Persian family, the Greece family and the Rome family. They are all the families of the north and he's going to call them to do what? To judge his people because his people are doing what? Worshipping like Babylonians, Medo-Persians, Greece, Greeks and Romans. He uses the king of the north to bring punishment on his own people for breaking the covenant. The covenant that Sister Rachel was talking about today, that God's people didn't keep, God punishes them by bringing the king of the north on them. What befalls God's people at the end of the world? The king of the north, the king of the north, the king of the north, the king of the north. It all depends on which end of the world you're living, which is what um, Brother James was talking about this morning. When is the end? Well, the, there was an end in Noah's time, an end in Moses' time, an end in Christ's time, an end in the Millerites' time. And what befalls them all in that time is the king of the north. That's the purpose of these kingdoms. So if we go to Daniel 11, we, you, do you see Babylon in Daniel 11? Kind of skips it. But we're in, we're in Jeremiah, who is Babylon? The original king of the north. We understand Babylon is the king of the north. So I'm going to write king of the north here. But I'll put it in brackets because it's implicit in Daniel 11. But then we've told Medo-Persians come. And the Medo-Persians are the king of the north. Let, let, let's just go back to our map. Here's Jerusalem. Here's this land bridge between Asia Minor and Europe and Egypt. Mediterranean Sea, Arabian Desert. So Alexander's kingdom broke up into how many parts? North, south, east, west. The four winds of heaven. What happened over time? Over time... The east conquered the west. Once the east... If you knock out the king of the north, who do you become? You become the king of the north. So over time you end up with two, let's just put it that way. You've got a king of the north and a king of the south. Are you happy being the king of the north or the king of the south or the king of the east or the king of the west? You want to be king of... The whole bang lot. Okay, so what's, what is, what's separate? If you wanted to conquer Egypt, where do you have to go? You've got to go through the glorious land. There's this land bridge. Why would you want to conquer Egypt? What's in Egypt? Food. The breadbasket of the world. Uh, riches, because all the wealth of Africa comes up through the, you know, the Ethiopian traders into Egypt. 
So in order to conquer, be conqueror of the world, you have to conquer Egypt, but then you have to conquer God's people. So what always befalls God's people? The king of the north, whether it's Babylon or Medo-Persia or Greece or Rome, in order to get Egypt, it's got to come down and conquer God's people. And why does God allow them to do that? Because of their backslidden condition. He allows them to do that to bring judgment on them for breaking the covenant, being unthankful and unholy and disobedient. Four, burning incense unto other gods and worshipping the works of their own hands. If you worship the works of your own hands, that's paganism because you're worshipping yourself. And that's crazy talk. That's what started in heaven, was brought down to, to the Garden of Eden and has continued on as the continual or daily religion from the very beginning. So the original king of the north is Babylon. He gets knocked out in Daniel chapter 5. And who takes over? The Medes and Persians and they become the king of the north. They get knocked off by Greece who becomes the king of the north. And then we come down to Rome, Rome who becomes the king of the north. So, whoops, sorry. So Rome comes in three stages, pagan, papal and modern Rome. Each of those are the, are the king of the north. So what is the purpose of the papal Rome at the end of the world? It's what befalls God's people. For what purpose? to bring punishment and chastisement for covenant breaking, backsliding people. That's their purpose. So what's the theme of Daniel 11? I'm going to write it's their job description or their purpose. The whole purpose of these, God uses them. Brother James, I'm sorry. How are we going for time? Right at, yeah, right at okay, so we might leave it there. And tomorrow what we're going to come back and look at is that's not the whole story of the book of Daniel or the prophecies of Daniel. Because this is the story of Babylon, the king of the north. And we know that there is also the story of Jerusalem. So we want to learn what we can learn about God's kingdom from the book of Daniel. So is there any questions on what we've done so far? just okay so what we've done is we've seen how God has outlined the problem the problem is God God's people are in a backslidden um, condition and God uses the king of the north he has a purpose for them but he's also going to give us the solution. This would be quite depressing if we just left it right here. So in the morning, we'll come back and we'll look at Jerusalem, at what God's plans for his people and how he brings them out of that backslidden condition and his purpose for them at the end of the world. So, I have a question. So when you look at the Jeremiah 1, verses 13 through 16, it says God uses the king of the north to punish the... The Israelites um, but then also we know that the king of the north has his own agenda and so how do you kind of like reconcile those two God is using um, the agenda of the king of the north to punish the Israelites then, then whose agenda is it uh, well we could uh, touch on that again probably in the morning because um, I, gu I guess the, the king of the north is Satan's kingdom, but God is overruling. So you've got God and Satan uh, working their own purposes out, but God's, <coughs> in God's providence, uh, it, it, it is all done for the greater good. If we were to take these last three Romes and we were to put them on a line, we would see that they follow the same pattern. Pagan Rome. In Daniel chapter 11 has to conquer three geographical areas. 
It, become, it conquers Greece. It conquers the Seleucid Empire, that fourth, fourth um, fraction of Greece to become king of the north. So it conquers the king of the north to become the king of the north in 65 BC. So go back to our map. Here's Jerusalem, here's Egypt, here's the north. So Rome comes from the west, conquers the north, becomes the king of the north. Then who's it going to conquer next? It's got to conquer the glorious land, doesn't it? So it conquers the glorious land when? 63 BC. And then it's going to conquer what? Egypt. Egypt. When does it conquer Egypt? Um, six, 31 BC, Battle of Actium. And it rules the world for how long? 360, a time. Or 360 years, which takes you to when? 330 AD, and what happens in 330 AD? Constantine moves his capital. And this is when Rome falls. Papal Rome. Conquers how many geographical areas? What are those three geographical areas? Weren't there three horns that got plucked up? So Rome, because of this, Rome divides into how many? Ten. Ten horns. Three get plucked up. Okay. The Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths win. Ostrogoths win. Come on, you good Adventists. <laughs> You know it. No, close though. No cigar. 538. And rules the world for how long? A time, times, and half a time, or 1260. And then what happens? It falls. 1798. What causes the fall here? What's happening? What comes? All these trumpet powers. What calls the fall here? Good. Trumpet powers. Okay, so this is all the book of Revelation. Re, oh, sorry, Daniel. This is Daniel 11. This is Daniel 11. But Revelation fills in the gaps. How does it fall? Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter um, 8. Revelation chapter nine, or 11. Okay, so we come down to modern Rome. Daniel 11, 40 to 45, we might go over that. How many geographical areas? Sorry, Papal Rome, what happens in 1798? Deadly wound. Deadly wound's got to be healed. That healing, it's got to conquer three geographical areas. What's it got to conquer? The King of the South. And who else? Not, no, glorious land. And then Egypt, and then it's going to rule the world for how long? Short space, not long. And then it's going to fall. So when we look at these patterns, who's in control, God or Satan? I don't, I don't think Satan is capable of this. This, this is the handprint of God. This is line upon line. This is history repeating. This is God. Um, God is the end. Reveals the end from the beginning. Yes. And when you see these patterns, that that's not God is God is not the author of confusion. And this actually isn't confusion. When you can lay things out line upon line and see history repeating, it's it's um, while God while certainly while they worship the way they're worshiping, it's it's they're. It's a spirit of Satan, but this, 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 this tells us that it's a fingerprint of God that is, use, you know, uh, um, his providential care is over it all. So I guess it, it's, a, it's an anomaly because going back to what Wen, Sister Wendy said, 
Our enemy is who? The king of the north. So where's the king of the south here in Daniel chapter 11? Who's our enemy? The king of the north. The king of the north is Babylon and the Babylon is Satan's kingdom. So who's the king of the south? Is it Satan's kingdom? Is it God's kingdom? It's an independent. <coughs> it, it, it doesn't listen to God and it doesn't listen to Satan. Yeah. It, it's this, it's, see, it's these, we have to understand how these trumpet powers work. Because the trumpet powers, it, Islam is a trumpet power. What, what are we told about Islam in Genesis uh, 16? His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand shall be against him. Does he listen to anybody? No. Does he listen to God? Does he listen to Satan? Neither does the king of the south. <laughs> They're independent agencies. God can use them, Satan can use them, but neither of them are a part of his kingdom. That, I, and I'm not talking about individuals who'll be calling, you know. Can, can I ask a question? On the illustrations that you have put out over there, you have, you, have, you have talked about the wound that the Papa Sinica in 1998, the wound. Yeah. What was the wound anyways? All right, we'll, yeah. we'll look at that. So if I can hold that question, because that's going to, we'll be looking at that in more detail. Um, and we'll come back to that. We, we might go over this history a bit better, especially Daniel 11, 40 to 45. You can't understand the healing of the deadly wound in, in, unless you understand the inflicting of the de deadly wound. So, so we'll look at that. But the point I really want to leave on is that the king, what is the king of the south doing here? It's actually holding back the king of the north. As, as evil and as, you know, as, as, as bad as they are, they're restraining the king of the north from bringing judgment. They're distracting it. So the king of the north really is, uh, sorry, the king of the south isn't really, it's neither one or the other. But it, it plays, God, God uses it. Does that make any? While the king of the south is holding back the king of the north, the king of the north is not, until the king of the north conquers the king of the south here, can it bring down the glorious land? No. So it's being restrained here by the king of the south. And we can see that um, it's just a repeat of the history of pagan Rome. So we might review that tomorrow. So we might leave it there and we'll close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that your hand is over all the things that happen in history and today in the present day and we just trust that um, you are working your purposes out. We want to be Daniel's people. Uh, we understand that punishment is brought upon your people but we also pray that you would grant us a message to bring the warning that is necessary, that is necessary for you. Um, your church and then the warning that is to go to the world so as we leave tonight we pray for traveling mercies we pray for a restful night that we'll be able to think on these things chew on them and come back tomorrow and, and get greater clarity and so uh, we just leave ourselves in your care and ask in Jesus name Amen, Amen.